In order for a written text to be understandable to others, it has to have a certain kind of structure. This obviously goes for spoken language as well, but because communicating in writing doesn't give us the same opportunities for immediate feedback and clarification that spoken communication does, it's particularly important for written language. This means that the links and connections between different parts of a text and between different pieces of information given in a text have to be made clear to the person reading the text. We talk about two types of structuring devices which we use to achieve this, coherence and cohesion. You can't just put a random collection of sentences together to produce a meaningful text. For example, the following is not a good text. There are several different word classes in English and other languages. My name is John. Which is your favorite kind of dessert? My uncle will arrive tomorrow. What's wrong with this piece of text? It doesn't seem to be about anything. Or, to put it another way, the individual sentences don't seem to have anything to do with each other. That is, a text as a whole should be about something. And in fact, the term aboutness is sometimes used. We say that a text needs to have coherence. There needs to be a connection between the topics that are described or discussed in each sentence. Notice that mentioning the same word in successive sentences does not guarantee that it will be coherent. Every day I feed my cat. Cats have four legs. The cat is on the mat. Mat's, mat has three letters. Even though every sentence in this text has something in common with the one that came before it, it still doesn't seem to be about anything. It has no coherence. Now look at the following. The first man landed on the moon in July 1969. At the same time, a boy died in Alabama of untreated pneumonia. At first sight, these two sentences may not seem to have anything to do with each other. But there is a topic that links the two, namely the distribution of resources. The text contrasts two events where one cost an enormous amount of resources, whereas the other would have cost very little to prevent. So this is a coherent text because it is about a particular topic. Notice also that the device that this text uses to establish the connection between the two events, the prepositional phrase, at the same time. Using some bit of language to tie together the different parts of a text in this way is called cohesion. Cohesive devices are used to make clear what the link is between different parts of a text. If we look at the sentences, I was tired, I ran three miles, then it may not be clear how the two are meant to relate to each other. However, if we add a cohesive device, such as however or nevertheless, the connection becomes clear. I was tired, nevertheless, I ran three miles. There are many different types of cohesive devices. We'll look at a few here. Lexical cohesion is concerned with words and phrases which are involved in some kind of meaning relation and which act to unify the text. That is, they provide links between or among sentences to create a cohesive text. What is a meaning relation? Words and phrases can be involved in various kinds of meaning relations. They can mean the same thing, opposite things, they can refer to things that are similar or to things that are part of the same overall object, and so on. The most obvious type of meaning relation is repetition of the same word or phrase. Consider the following text. There were birds everywhere. There were birds clasping the windowsills, birds clinging to the rafters, birds, birds perched on the roof, and birds flapping on the ground. Here, the repetition of the word birds birds everywhere, birds clasping the windowsills, birds clinging to the rafters, birds, per birds perched on the roof, birds flapping on the ground, links up each statement through what we call a lexical chain. Each link of the chain has associated with it different aspects of the same theme, a set of different activities, clasp, cling, perch, flap, and a set of different places, ground, roof, rafters, windowsill. But using a cohesive device like repetition does not in itself guarantee that a text will be well formed and meaningful. Look at this text. I used to like looking at birds when I was young. There are many different kinds of birds in South America. 
every morning I am woken up early by the birds singing outside of my house, which greatly annoys me. Did you know that birds are apparently descended from dinosaurs? The text is cohesive in that the word birds is used in every sentence, but it's not coherent. It doesn't seem to be about anything. When words or phrases have the same meaning, we say that they are synonyms. For example, big and large are synonyms. They're two different words with the same meaning. Synonymy is one type of meaning relation. Sometimes words or phrases don't have the same meaning, but related meanings, and this is another meaning relation. <coughs> By choosing words or phrases with the same or similar meanings, we can help make a text cohesive. We went shopping intending to buy a pair of shoes. However, we could not resist the summer bargains and acquired two pairs of shoes and put a pair of boots for winter on lay-by. The sale was so good that we also purchased a new CD player as well as getting several new discs. Here, we have several words with the same or similar meanings. Shopping, buy, acquired, purchased, getting. These words keep the text focus in, focused in one particular semantic field. Likewise, bargains and sale are very close in meaning. Another type of meaning relation is contrast and oppositeness in meaning. The following text is largely built on a series of contrasts. The dark cover of the night wraps its mantle over the earth's contours, hiding all in its shadows. The revealing light of morning pulls back the coverlet and exposes the crisp, clear outlines in its brilliant rays. The contrasts include dark cover and revealing light, night and morning, wraps its mantle and pulls back the coverlet, hiding and exposes and shadows and clear outlines. Another meaning relation involves names of sets and subsets. The te technical name for this is hyponymy. For example, poodle names a subset of dog. A poodle is a kind of dog. There's also a meaning relationship between poodle and other words that name other kinds of dogs, for example, Labrador, Greyhound, or Terrier. Texts can be tied together by using words which have these kinds of meaning relation, like the following. The North Coast is the best place to grow fruit. There you can see delicious stands of bananas, plantations of pineapples and sugarcane, as well as acres of apples. But the best of all are the pawpaws and mangoes. Here we have the name of a set, fruit, and words for different kinds of fruit, and these terms tie the different sentences together. There is also a meaning relationship which involves names of parts and names of holes. If you start talking about a car and then go on to mention engine, driver, tyres and so on, then this will be interpreted as belonging to the car that you started out with. This meaning relation is called meronymy and we can see it in this text. The cat dashed up to the base of the tree, leapt from the protrud protruding root to the trunk, scrabbled up to the first branch, resting in the fork for a minute, then climbed higher to an overhanging limb where it nestled comfortably in the foliage. The hole, which is the tree, is mentioned early in the text, and then a series of parts of the tree, root, trunk, branch, fork, limb, foliage. Note that once they've introduced the tree, the writer doesn't have to specify which root and trunk and so on, because it's clearly the root and trunk, etc., of the tree that was mentioned first. Grammatical cohesion involves using grammatical words or structures to establish connections between parts of a text. One way of doing this is by using words which refer to the same thing. Look at the following text. I saw my father yesterday. He was looking tired. What does the word he mean here? In this case, it means my father. But we only know this because of the context that he appears in. If I just said he was looking tired, out of context, you wouldn't know who he was supposed to refer to. So the word he gets its reference from the context that it's used in. In this case, it gets it from the noun phrase my father in the first sentence. And so we have a tie between the first and the second sentences, my father and he. In this way, these two sentences are linked together, and this helps the cohesion of the overall text. There are many other words that work in the same way. For example, 
Last year, I went to Kyrgyzstan. The mountains there were beautiful. There refers to a place, but out of context, you wouldn't know which place. It's only the context that tells you which place there is. We can tell that there refers to the same place as Kyrgyzstan. And so again, we have a link between the two sentences, which creates cohesion. The examples we've just looked at involve words which refer back to something in the previous linguistic context. This is called anaphoric reference. The words he and there point back to something that's been mentioned earlier. It's also possible for a word to point forward in a text to something that will be mentioned later. This is called cataphoric reference. This is what I want you to do. Go to the store and buy some apples. This here means go to the store and get some apples, which occurs in the following part of the sentence. And so again, we get a link between the two parts of the sentence. Another kind of grammatical cohesion is called conjunction. We've looked at the part of speech called conjunctions, and we've seen that they're used to connect sentences or parts of sentences to indicate some sort of relation between them. Consider the following. John grew up in Maitland and spent much of his life there. Here, and connects the two clauses of the sentence. The conjunction indicates that the information in the second clause is relevant to the first clause. It would be odd to take two clauses which have nothing to do with each other and connect them with and. For example, John grew up in Maitland and linguistics is very interesting. We can use conjunctions and related words to indicate different kinds of connections between clauses. The word however indicates a contrast. Mary was poor, however, she was honest. Then indicates a relationship in time. I came home, then I turned on the TV. Here, then connects the two sentences and indicates that what's described in the second sentence occurred after what's described in the first sentence. Phrases like because of that or as a result indicate a causal relationship. John drank too much wine last night. As a result, he did not feel very good this morning. As a result indicates a causal relation. What's described in the first sentence is indicated to be the cause of what's described in the second sentence. The last type of grammatical cohesion we're going to look at is called ellipsis. Ellipsis means leaving a word out altogether because it's understood to refer to the same thing as something that's already been mentioned. Mary took her car and John took his. John took his what? His car. Leaving out the head of the noun phrase here is a way of indicating that we need to look to the previous clause to find out what it's meant to be. So this is another type of cohesive device. Here are some more examples of ellipsis. John bought an umbrella and Mary a raincoat. What did Mary do? She bought a raincoat. Leaving out the word verb bought again is a clue to look to the previous clause to find out what the verb is meant to be. We also see ellipses in an example that we've already looked at. John grew up in Maitland and spent much of his life there. Who spent much of his life there? John did. We could have had he in the subject position of the second clause and it would have re referred back to John. John grew up in Maitland and he spent much of his life there. But instead, the subject of the second clause has been left out altogether, leaving us to infer that it's the same as the subject of the first clause. We can use ellipses when two clauses have the same subject, and in fact this is very common in English. Instead of saying, I came home from work and I took a bath, the sentence seems to flow better if we leave the second I out and just say, I came home from work and took a bath. But the grammar of English does not allow us to do this with an object, even if it's the same in both clauses. We can't say, John baked the cake and Mary ate with the meaning that the thing Mary ate was the cake that John baked. If we want to indicate that the object is the same in both clauses, we have to use a pronoun in the second clause to refer back to the object of the first clause. John baked the cake and Mary ate it. To summarize, we've looked at two properties of a well-formed text, coherence and cohesion. Coherence refers to the fact that a text needs to be about something. There has to be some sort of thematic connection between the different parts of a text. Cohesion 
refers to the various linguistic tools we use to show how the different parts of the text are linked. We talked about lexical cohesion, which was about using meaning relations between words to show these connections, and grammatical cohesion, which involved different kinds of devices such as reference, conjunction, and ellipsis. We also saw that the rules of grammar are involved in deciding how these devices can be used. For example, English grammar lets you use ellipsis when two clauses have the same subject, but not when they have the same object.